and I'm very pleased today to introduce our speaker who's going to talk about a subject that is of interest to all of us. Uh, and uh, I suspect that many of us will be buying electric vehicles uh, no. as our next car or in the future. Uh, and um, we're all much more aware of this subject than we were before, but there's still, for most of us, a lot to be learned. So we're very fortunate to have as our speaker today, Shani Jarvis. Shani is the Director of Public Affairs of the Automobile Association of America in the Northeast US. And she uh, is both an accomplished speaker, <laughs> as you will see uh, and hear, uh, and a knowledgeable person on, on this subject. So uh, she's had a very rough schedule lately, and so we're very honored and pleased that she is here. And so I turn the meeting over to Shani Jarvis. And Art, I want to thank you so much for giving me a, um, a promotion. <laughs> but I am just the manager of public affairs for the New Jersey area. Um, so we are in the whole Northeast. We're in um, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New, uh, parts of New York, parts of New Jersey, and all of Massachusetts. So I handle um, public affairs for and community events, traffic safety for the um, the six counties in northern New Jersey that we cover. So it's uh, and, and I teach everything from children in car seats to teen drivers to senior drivers that are looking to one, you know, eventually um, give up the keys but still remain mobile and everything in between on a wide variety of subjects. So I um it is, uh, it is a fun job to have. And as Art mentioned, yes, I have been all over the place lately. I was, uh, I, I received a panicked phone call last Sunday that my coworker was going to be presenting at a conference in Colorado. Um, and it's a very big deal. It's the AAA um, annual meeting. So it's all the CEOs from the different clubs. And she was supposed to leave Monday morning and she tested positive for COVID Sunday morning. So, she sent me in her stead. So I've been to Colorado. I came back from Colorado. I was in a high school the whole day when I got back. And then I went, I just came back from Wisconsin. So I've three different time zones. Um, but I am very excited to talk to you today about, <clears throat> sorry, I'm going to do that a lot too, um, about electric vehicles um, because there is some renewed interest. And we'll talk about that later as far as um, gas prices skyrocketing um, and what they're doing and possibly uh, moving more toward a hybrid or an electric vehicle. I personally, I drive, an, I, I drive a hybrid, which I will also talk about later. Um, and I, I just don't know if I could go back to uh, driving a full gas powered um, vehicle because I do enjoy getting 41 miles to the gallon um, at the moment. Um, and it is a little, it's a lot more to fill up my car now. It used to be about $20 and now it's about $40. Um, but that's, that's the direction that we're trending in. So this presentation is really just gonna cover the basics of EV ownership. Um, and it might be a little redundant, but if you can jump in for those of you that do have EVs, that would be great. Um, I would love to hear your experiences as well. Um, we will open it up for questions. So if that, if everybody's okay, I'm just gonna jump right in and um, share my screen. All right, can you, can you see this? Yes. Okay, perfect. So the presentation is called Join the Evolution. Um, and first things first, I do want to say thank you. I skipped a slide. No, I didn't. Um, thank you to Art for bringing um, for bringing me to the the old guard. It sounds like you guys are very active, and you have a lot a lot of things going on again, um, uh, uh, which is great. And it's nice that things are finally opening up again. Um, so when did it when did it all start? Um, electric cars actually, believe it or not, are not new. Um, they first appeared in some form probably about a century or so ago, and there were different inventors in the 1800s in um, Europe and uh, in even the U.S. that created some small-scale electric cars. Um, in the second half of the 19th century, so the late 1800s, some of the first practical EVs um, hit the road, 
And one that was in New Jersey, um, excuse me, in the United States was uh, a, a chemist by the name of William Morrison. He is credited with designing the first six passenger battery powered electric carriage. And it went very fast. It had a top speed of a whopping 14 miles per hour. Personally, I think I can walk faster than that, but at the time that was, that was it. Um, so as the story goes, he had a secret basement lab in his home. He created a prototype and um, he hired a mechanical engineer to build the actual electric carriage in 1890. So over the next few years, EVs did continue to evolve. Um, New York City, apparently, I think they had a fleet of 60 electric taxis. Um, and by about 1900, electric vehicles hit their heyday. And at that time, they accounted for one third of all the vehicles on the road. Okay. Keep in mind, we're still talking about the time of horse and buggies. Um, so as the 20th century or the 1900s began, horses were still the primary method of transportation, but Americans started to become more prosperous, have a little bit more money. And there were some different methods to power cars. So um, horses began to be replaced with steam engines, gasoline engines, and electric vehicles that had um, an electric, excuse me, steam, gasoline, and electric versions of these motor vehicles. So as you can imagine, there were probably some um, challenges with them, uh, primarily with steam. Steam ran out of steam, to, so to speak, because they required long startup times. So in most temperatures or even in cold weather, it could, could have taken as long as 45 minutes to start up a car. I do not know about you, but I do not have the ability to give myself an extra 45 minutes in the morning. Um, these cars also had to be refilled with water, obviously, and they had limited driving ranges. So gasoline powered cars were better, but you had to actually hand crank them. So kind of like the hand version of Fred Flintstone driving with his feet. Um, so they were difficult to drive. Obviously, you needed a lot of power to hand crank them. At the time, they were pretty noisy and they emit really bad fumes. Um, so um, electric cars were popular at the time because they were quiet. They were easy to drive. You didn't have fumes and they were perfect for short trips around town, which is mostly where people were going. So in the 1900s, you had a time of great innovations, right? So you've got motorized vehicles, you know, we're starting to go places. We want to see our friends. And the motorized vehicles were a lot more comfortable than horse and buggies um, and horse and wagons. So a name you might remember or a name you might know, Ferdinand Porsche created the first electric car. Um, and he also had the first electric hybrid vehicle. At the time, there were two other players in the market, Carl Benz, if that sounds familiar, it's because it's Mercedes Benz. Um, who tinkered with electric vehicles. They now have another, um, an electric vehicle. And then Sylvester Roper, who built a steam carriage. Coming up at the rear were Thomas Edison and Henry Ford, and they explored options for a low cost electric car. But if you guys know where I'm headed with this one, stop me. Um, Henry Ford actually pulled a fast one and he started uh, mass, ma mass manufacturing the Ford Model Ts, okay? So these were very affordable um, to the masses because they were done on an assembly line. So instead of 1750 or $1,750 for an electric roadster, it was $650 for a gas powered vehicle. And obviously to families, this was much more affordable. The, um, electric starter had also been um, started at this point. It had, it had been invented at this point. So now we no longer have this need to hand crank our um, hand crank our vehicles. Um, but it didn't take long. Obviously, technology changes. It evolves. It um, gets outdated. And by the 1920s, people had kind of started to move away from electric vehicles and steam vehicles. Steam, for the reason I mentioned before, but electric because outside the major cities, not many people had access to electricity. Um, so they all but disappeared by 1935. And now we've got gas flowing from oil wells and gas stations popping up. So it's easier to find a place to um, fill up your gas powered car than to charge your electric vehicle.
Does that sound familiar? Sorry. Okay. So we have gas, gas powered vehicles all over in the 1900s and then mid 19th century we've got gas shortages we've got um, gas price issues so again there's this renewed interest in evs again does that sound familiar um as well as other alternative vehicles that produce better mpg so like i said we're seeing history repeat itself and gas prices are skyrocketing so more people are interested in evs we're seeing it happen all over again so when gas prices soared um, in the 80s, um, manufacturers started to look at alternate fuels and different vehicles. And in the 1990s, the landscape for automobile automobiles changed because there were two pieces of legislation passed that were pretty important. So you had in 1990, you had the Clean Air Act. And in the 1992, you had the Energy Policy Act. So now it's cool to be green or eco-friendly. So again, we have this interest in renewed, uh, excuse me, in electric vehicles. So automakers were coming up with new tech designs, new technologies. Um, they had new speeds. They had wanted to get cars that would have a similar performance and speeds to the gasoline counterparts. So now you've got EVs that instead of short trips around town, they have ranges of like 60 miles. So General Motors took the lead with uh, this car here. It's called the EV1. And it had a driving range of 80 miles and the ability to accelerate from zero to 50 miles in seven seconds. But as with all good things, it cost a lot to produce. And so they discontinued this model in 2001. Does anybody remember seeing this car? No, I, I'm trying to think in 2001, I was just starting, um, just starting out. I graduated college. I don't remember seeing this, but that's not to say that it wasn't on the road, but I'm thinking it was primarily in areas where you do tend to see more EV adoption, like California um, and, the, and the West Coast. So there's this documentary um, in 2006 that was created that explains how this car was created, how it was um, the first electric, really the first electric vehicle in the US um, and basically what happened to them. So it was all of the same people that are entering and in the EV market today. So that film, if you, if you find it, it explores the role of American manufacturing how oil and the federal government and batteries and vehicles and consumer attitudes really limited the development and adoption of this technology. Um, so GM said it was limited consumer demand. So they made this huge effort to take them all back from everybody and then they crushed them. So there's, I believe, one or two in museums around the country, but you generally can't find it on the road anywhere. Um, so it is available on DVD. Um, it was introduced in June of 2006 at Sundance. So if you find it, enjoy. Um, so now we're entering the new century. EVs have a public relations and marketing problem. Generally still exists today, but it's slowly changing. So in the early 2000s, we had two history making products and market changing products. So the first is um, in 2000 when Toyota introduced the Prius. This was the first world mass produced hybrid EV that um, instantly appealed with celebrities. I am watching uh, at the moment Gilmore Girls. I don't know if any of you ever heard of it, but in it, Rory Gilmore's grandparents buy her a 2003 Toyota Prius. They say it's good on gas and it will say it's a safe car that will get her from point A to point B. Um, so the second big change was in 2006, uh, a little company you may have heard of, a little startup in Silicon Valley called Tesla, um, started producing some luxury electric vehicles that could go more than 200 miles on a single charge. So now when we think EVs, we think Tesla, but there are all the big manufacturers that are getting into the EV and the um, uh, hybrid electric vehicle market. 
And of course, there are tons of Chinese brands that maybe you we aren't even familiar with that have also entered the US market. So they're all over the place. I see Teslas everywhere. I have a neighbor up the street who drives a plug-in electric vehicle. And we'll talk about um, what the different types of electric vehicles are so that um, you don't have to just jump in both feet first full electric. You can sort of get there um, slowly. So we'll talk about that. So here are some different um, models that you may have seen on the roads today. There's all the top manufacturers, BMW, Ford, uh, Mercedes, are all entering the EV space. Of course, you will see some Teslas here. There's some Audis, uh, pickup trucks now. For those that like the, the big pickup trucks, they can get an EV pickup truck. Um, so once the Prius was introduced, over the next few years, automakers began working on other uh, electric vehicles. So the first plug-in hybrid was the Chevy Volt, and it was um, commercially available. And then the first car that was an all-electric vehicle powered by only an all-electric motor was the Nissan Leaf. Both of these vehicles exist on the road today. Um, so at the time, the federal government began investing um, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to build national infrastructure of charging stations, which is still happening. It's still ongoing. I'll touch on that in a little bit when we talk about charging. Um, and there's always research into new battery technology, how we can improve ranges, how we can lower the consumer purchase price, because obviously it is a little bit more of an investment up front. So today, consumers have the choice of more than 23 different models of plug-in hybrid electric vehicles or plug-in electric vehicles and 36 hybrid models in various sizes. So you have everything from a two-passenger smart car all the way up to a BMW's luxury SUV. So I did mention all the manufacturers are getting into this space. Did anybody, the last time I did this presentation, it was March 3rd and it was right after the Super Bowl. But did anyone notice, did anybody watch the Super Bowl? And did anyone notice that a lot of the commercials were actually for EVs? Yep, I, I picked, I think there were four or five in the first half alone, everything from a small sedan to one of the, the pickup trucks. Excuse me. Um, so with that history, I'm going to move into types of electric vehicles, and then we're going to talk about um, charging. So an electric vehicle is technically a generic term for any vehicle that uses electricity to power a motor. So that electricity will either come from a battery, a fuel cell, or perhaps a small engine um, in the vehicle. So the different types you have are your hybrids. These are referred to as HEVs. You have your plug-in hybrids, which are PHEVs, your battery electric vehicles, BEVs, and your fuel cell electric vehicles, FCEV. That is an alphabet soup. So the hybrid electric vehicle, this is what I drive. That is my car at the top right, a uh, top left. It is a Ford Fusion. Um, this vehicle uses both gas and electricity and it does not have any external charging capability. So I cannot plug this in. It does have high fuel economy. Like I said, I get 41 miles to the gallon and it has low emissions, um, but it has the power and range of a gas powered vehicle. So all the vehicle, all the energy comes from the gasoline, but the battery in the vehicle, so my battery's in the trunk and it's charged through regenerative break, regenerative braking. So I have found in the six years that I've had this car that my braking skills have gotten better. I don't press hard on the gas or the brake. I'm a little bit more smoother with my movements. Um, and because I can't plug into an electrical source, I can't really go that far on the electric uh, battery unless I'm coasting. Um, once I hit the gas, the engine will generally kick on. So my car is very quiet. Um, when it first starts, you can't hear it. When it's going on the electric battery, you can't hear it, but you definitely know when the engine kicks on, when it rolls over, because you hear it and it sounds like an actual, um, uh, actual gas-powered vehicle. So then we have plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. 
These also use both gas and electricity, but the difference between these and the regular hybrids is that they have the ability to plug in and they have external charging capabilities. So these can go 20 to 40 miles on the battery, whereas my car can go maybe two to five. Um, also, it will go longer on the gas powered engine. And when it's driven in electric only mode, there are no emissions. OK, so um, once the all electric range is depleted, like on the other car, they act as regular hybrid vehicles can travel 700 miles, several, excuse me, not seven, several hundred miles on a tank of gas. Um, so these um, can be charged at home, they can be charged in the public. Um, we'll talk about charging, home charging versus uh, public charging and the different levels of chargers um, in a few slides. But there are more than 30 different PHEVs um, available in the US. So the one I just showed you, the, the Fusion, there is actually a plug-in version of this called the uh, energy. Um, so it's the fusion energy and it has the, uh, the plug-in um, capabilities, plug-in hybrid. Okay. So then we have our battery electric vehicles. These use only electricity. They are externally charged and they have 85 to 500 mile ranges because they're not gas powered at all. They have no emissions. So these are your Tesla, your Ford Mach-E, which I heard is a great car. Um, uh, they're powered solely by the electric vehicle. They're capable of fast charging and level two charging. Um, so uh, let's see. Then we have fuel cell electric vehicles. You probably have not seen these. Um, so these are powered by electricity, but not by a battery. Um, they're powered by hydrogen and that energy in the, in the fuel cell is stored as hydrogen and converted to electricity by the fuel cell. So these are very early in the um, implementation stages and they're primarily in California, okay? So they have about a 400 mile driving range and can be refueled in five minutes. So this car here is called the Toyota Mirai, M-A-M-I-R-A-I. Um, again, these are not widely adopted yet, so you probably will not see this on the road. So let's talk about charging options. So you've got your level one chargers. These are your standard 120 volt AC household outlets. This is actually the slowest way to charge. Um, so if you're gonna do this, this is something you would charge overnight at home. Um, it can take anywhere from eight to more than 20 hours for a full charge. So would not be recommended to knock to, to drain the battery, um, it would just be used to top off the battery. Um, overnight charging is recommended, and this is standard equipment in most of your EVs. So then you move up a level and you've got level two charging. This uses a 240 volt outlet and may require special charging equipment that can range from 500 to $2,000. This is generally what you'll find in, um, in your public charging locations. Um, in workplaces, and some people will upgrade their home electricity to um, their home electric grid to accommodate the 240 volt outlets. This one, about three hours to 12 hours to charge. So again, probably not good to like let the car completely die and then charge. Um, be somewhere that you have a, a long time to charge it. Then you've got your level three or your DC fast charging. So these are special chargers that are 480 volts. They're direct current. They will provide roughly 50 to 80% of your charge in 30 minutes. So these are the ones you'll see at highway rest areas, at malls, at airports, um, some movie theaters, um, generally anywhere you're gonna be for a little while, at least an hour. And then, we also have the Tesla supercharger. So this is actually only available to Tesla owners. I have seen these in a lot of places. There are more than 20,000 stations nationwide and it is the largest and largest global and fastest charging network. Um, don't know, I've seen these at the AMC theater in Rockaway. They have an entire bank 
of just Tesla chargers. Um, and so when you go into watch a movie, plug into your charger, you've got a full charge when you come out of your movie. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about buying an electric vehicle and um, some of the rebates that are available to you and some of the things you have to think about when you want to buy an EV. So these are typically more expensive than gas, pow gas powered vehicles, but there are benefits that will offset that uh, initial purchase. And over the life of the vehicle, obviously your gas costs will be less um, I have a friend that has a, uh, a Tesla and she said she absolutely loves driving past gas stations um, and not knowing that she doesn't have to fill up at a gas station, um, especially now that I think I saw 450 something in New Jersey um, when I got home. So of all EVs, the Prius is probably going to be your least expensive. It's going to um, be in the $25,000 range, which is comparable to many gas powered vehicles but the more luxurious you want the more bells and whistles you want if it's fully electric it's going to be have a higher price tag some of these can go as high as six figures um so there are some factors that do offset the initial purchase price of an ev um and the first that comes to mind is of course going to be your fuel costs so consumer reports did a story and they found that your fuel savings can be just under five thousand dollars or more during the first seven years of ev ownership i do not know about you but i would love an extra five thousand dollars over the life of my car so if you also compare an ev to its gas counterpart you're going to take into consideration repair and maintenance you will also see total savings of between six thousand and ten thousand over the ownership of your vehicle um so AAA also does some studies and we found um obviously not me i'm not that particular branch of triple a um but they found that the overall cost of ev ownership is generally it is a little bit more um compared to your vast gas vehicle it's about eight percent more per year but your fuel and your maintenance costs are going to be a lot less um so it's going to cost an average of six hundred dollars in electric costs to operate an ev but it is going to cost about $1,200 for a gas operated vehicle if you drive both a similar distance of, say, 15,000 miles. Um, and then as far as maintenance is concerned, it's about $300 for an EV compared to $1,000 annually for a gas powered vehicle. Because, again, you're not going to have your oil changes. You're not going to have your fil air filter replacements or anything like that. So your benefits of having an EV, you've got a clean, quiet ride, limited to no maintenance, low to no emissions, lower state registration fees, federal tax credits, and New Jersey has some rebates, incentives, and perks as well. Um, so the federal tax credit ranges from about $2,500 to $7,500 for the purchase of a new plug-in electric drive motor vehicle. Um, and that credit is going to depend on a lot of different things. It's going to depend on the battery capacity, the price of the car, all that kind of stuff. Um, some manufacturers um, uh, like Tesla have already exceeded the availability of this particular um, tax credit. But I have heard um, that Tesla can, ten, can be generous depending on your vehicle when you are trading in a gas powered vehicle. Why? Because they want you in their car. Um, so every state also offers a rebate program. So you've got federal and then you've got state and it generally it varies by state, but it's generally around two thousand dollars and it's a rebate. So first you buy the vehicle um, and then you have, you know, all paperwork that you have to fill out and proof of purchase. And then you will receive a rebate for two thousand dollars. The other thing is in the state of New Jersey, there is no sales tax if you purchase an EV. So that is something to keep in mind because at 6.625%, that's a pretty considerable cost savings. So also um, some things in New Jersey, there is an HOV lane exemption. Um, so the New Jersey Turnpike Authority will um, allow qualified PHEVs and BHEVs to travel in HOV lanes on the turnpike between exits 11 and exit 14. 
Um, and then there is also a discount for um, Easy Pass. So it's a plug-in electric vehicle toll discount program. Um, so it's it's called the Green Pass. And basically, if you drive an EV or a plug-in hybrid, um, you are an enrolled Easy Pass customer. You will receive a discount off the full fare off-peak tolls on the New Jersey Turnpike and the Garden State Parkway. And then you have to, um, in order to account for, uh, in order to be eligible for this discount, you have to meet at least 45 miles per gallon. So when I first got my car, um, I was getting about 46 miles to the gallon. So I would have qualified for that, but now I'm down to about 41.4. Um, but you also have to meet the California super ultra low emission vehicle standard to be eligible for that discount. So in order to get that, you would submit a request in writing, you would submit proof of eligibility to the Easy Pass um, customer service center and tell them that you would like the Easy Pass discount and you would like to be enrolled in the Green Pass program. <clears throat> Do I have any questions so far? I see that there are three things in the chat. Let's see what they say. Um, the difference in the charging costs. Um, it depends on it depends on the charger. Are you talking about if you're at home or in the? Um, this is Mitch. Are you talking about if you're at home or if you're out in public? Mitch, unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Mitch, can you? Can you ask your question? Can you? Uh, it's not working. Um, maybe he stepped away. That's possible. We can, yeah. we can. Um... Yeah, there was uh, another. Uh, there was another hand raised. Mike Martin, let me send you an unmute request, and you can ask a question. Um. Uh, Sharon, thank you. I'll make this brief. Uh, one one technician suggested that. Uh, you should not buy an electric vehicle, and I'll tell you the reasons why. You should lease it. And the theory he came up with was that essentially battery technology can only improve. So this means that if you own an electric vehicle, chances are it's kind of like yesterday's computer. Your range will be limited. And essentially, you should go for a lease and not be essentially obsolete. Uh, can you comment on that? Do you believe that, or is that, you know, uh, is that a perception one should have when you're purchasing a vehicle? So, from a personal standpoint, I am a big proponent of leasing. Um, it, it does have its challenges. Um, I don't lease anymore just because I drive far. I drive. 105 miles a day when I go to my office. Um, so it's not it's not good for me. Um, but yes, absolutely. You could lease an EV. You will also get um, you will also get uh, I believe there's an incentive if you purchase a leased one or a used one as well. And again, like you said, technology can only improve. So if you buy it outright, you might be stuck with in a couple years an outdated technology whereas if you lease it for three years you would be able to get the next um you know tech next uh version in that car so i am personally i like to lease but that's up to everybody i know there are people out there that are strictly against leasing um that will only buy their cars outright but it's it's a personal decision that you have to make um but i would i would lease an i would lease an ev um because like you said it's only going to get technology is only going to change um so you want to make sure that you have the most uh up-to-date vehicle that's on the road or you want to at least make sure you have the best battery technology you possibly can does that answer your question can, can i add a comment to that this is sure. paul um it seems to me that uh, although battery technology is surely going to improve i doubt if the energy efficiency will improve so if your main reason for wanting an EV is to reduce your cost of energy, that's not going to matter. What will improve is your range. So higher capacity batteries, less charging. So it all it depends a lot on your own personal driving habits. You know, I'm not going on long trips and commuting long distances anymore. So I'm not often getting too far away from home so the range doesn't matter for me as much as it used to 
that's that's absolutely true so during covid it was not an issue for me either just because i was working from home um now that we're back in the office three days a week my commute one way is 65 miles um so it's like 110 miles a day just driving to and from my office and let's not even throw in when i do in-person presentations and stuff like that so again leasing not for me anymore because i drive too much um but i do need for me i do need to consider range because i do drive long time and i am uh, i love to drive to my destination when i am uh, when i'm traveling i obviously grew up on the east coast so my grandparents lived in virginia where it's it's very easy for me to jump in the car and drive to virginia drive up and i've literally been up and down the entire eastern seaboard i drive out to michigan um so range for me is uh is a big is a big factor would be a big factor but again all of this stuff is going to be personal to you your driving habits where you go how often you go um your wallet you know i can't i can't say it's it's one size fits all um back here let's see if i can't okay why is it not moving okay so you may when you go look at an ev you may see uh mpge um this is going to tell you what the range of the vehicle is or what the approximate annual fuel fuel cost would be compared to a gasoline vehicle um so the epa fuel economy label um is going to show mpge and this is a method that was developed by the department of energy to make it easier for consumers to compare the fuel economy across a uh, all different electric vehicle types, but also see what it would be like in comparison to a gasoline vehicle. So on the label on the left, you'll see the number of miles you could drive on a gallon of gas. And in contrast, on the right, it will show you the number of miles the vehicle can be driven on a, on a single charge. And then the fuel and electricity is calculated and compared with the same energy content as a gallon of gasoline. So um, another AAA study found that there were some discrepancies in the accuracy of the fuel economy and EV range um, that some auto manufacturers claimed on their windshields, uh, on their window stickers. So the EPA does rely on automakers to accurately represent their vehicles um, efficiency and AAA research did find that fewer than 10% of tests validate their initial claims. So just as with any big large scale purchase you would make in your life, you would want to do all of the research that you could possibly do and make sure you're getting the best deal and it's gonna work for you and it's what you need. So we'll talk about the concept of plugging in um, and public chargers. So um, this is a lot of what people get scared about. Um, so depending on the model vehicle you have, you could very well plug it in at home, right? I have a neighbor up the street, they upgraded their grid to, um, to charge their vehicle. Our CEO drives a Tesla. He also upgraded his electrical grid at home to accommodate the, the, the Tesla charging. So let's say you're on a road trip. Where are your public charging stations? Um, there are, according to the DOE, there's about 41,000 charging stations nationally. Does not sound like a lot. Um, 5,000 of these are fast chargers, but there are 41,000 chargers, which means there are more than 80,000 outlets available across the country. Um, in New Jersey, there's about 650 total parking, total public charging locations. 79 are the DC fast chargers. But for the most part in the state of New Jersey, you're going to be within a 25 mile radius of a DC fast charger, no matter where you are. Okay. Um, and it was recently announced in New Jersey that we will receive more than 15 million from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that will help build out an EV charging infrastructure. And the investment, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, say that 10 times fast is going to one of the things that was built into that is a developing a network of chargers across the country by 2030. 
Um, so to find a charging station, you would actually go to this website right here. And I do have this presentation available that I can send as a, as a PDF that will have all the, um, the links built in. Um, so it's the AFDC alternative fuels um, from the um, dot energy dot gov, excuse me. Or you can visit any of these different um, apps, ChargePoint, EVgo, AAA. Um, there's a lot of these, these popping up. Um, I know that our car doctor, who I will touch on briefly, what he does, he uses ChargePoint because um, he has an he has a uh, electric vehicle. So AAA continues to study the use of EVs um, and consumer perceptions. Now there are people that only want an EV for their next vehicle. There are people that are somewhere on the fence, maybe want to start with a plug-in or a hybrid before making the jump to EVs. And then there are the never EV people who will never own an EV, have no interest in owning an EV, don't want an EV. And we respect all of that. Um, so again, vehicle ownership, whatever it is you're driving, it's a personal choice. Um, so AAA studies found two reasons for the people who don't want EVs or why people shy away from EVs is they don't think there are enough places to charge. And I will say there is a dearth of charging in the middle of the country. That's why this money from the Investment Infrastructure, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is going to help build out that, in, um, that network of chargers. Um, this is obviously still a very developing technology, and we are years, years away from. We're 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 still in the the implementation stages as far as this is concerned. Um, the second reason is that they'll have they have range anxiety, which is the fear that they'll run out of juice while driving, similar to how a gas powered vehicle will run out of gas on the road. So this gentleman here said, range anxiety is generally only a concern to people who don't drive electric. My CEO says the exact same thing. He's like, I never, I don't have the fear of running out of a charge. Um, there's enough places that I can stop for an hour, charge my car and continue on my way. Um, so these, these, these fears, I'm not going to say they're unfounded because people have, you know, their beliefs. Um, but 95% of EV owners in that survey that we surveyed said they've never run out of a charge on a trip and they do most of their charging at home. Um, and then once the consumer made the leap to electric, their fear sort of disappeared once they realized that there were ample places to charge and they, um, they did have the ability. So AAA believes that consumers have a better understanding of the real cost and experience of owning an EV than that gap between um, those who are interested in it but have actually purchased it will, will actually close. Um, and so this quote is actually from a CEO of a Netherlands-based company that is the leading provider of charging solutions. And this particular company focuses um, strictly on electric travel, primarily in Europe. So you can look at all different types of electric vehicles and gas powered vehicles by going to the AAA.com car guide. Um, it's a free download and they have looked at lots and lots and lots of different vehicles and they compare and contrast and it's a great one stop resource um, for being able to determine uh, what kind of car you want to be your next car. And then this is just kind of a look uh, at what's going on in the national front. Um, so like I said, that $1 trillion Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is going to prioritize the development of a national EV charging network. So the goal of that and the, um, that program is to have at least 500,000 additional devices installed across the US by 2030. Um, so the law, also pushes for the development and adoption of EVs by including money to retool factories, to provide incentives, like we talked about before, and um, more incentives to develop a charging infrastructure. So again, this is a monumental undertaking, guys. This is not something that's going to happen overnight. The idea of there being an EV in every garage is decades away. Um, but 
that's kind of where we're headed. And obviously we do know that changing consumer perceptions is going to take time. Um, and it's all about education, educate, educate, educate. Um, so here are some resources for you um, for, uh, for electric vehicles. You've got the New Jersey um, Department of Environmental Protection. So they have the Drive Green program. You've got the Clean Energy Program, the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, the EPA, our AAA newsroom. We do a lot of stories on um, electric vehicles. Again, you've got the AAA car guide. And then we did, during COVID, we pivoted a lot of our programs from in-person to virtual. And we did a lot of um, electric vehicle uh, webinars or one-on-one -on -one interviews. We have two guys um, that are our car gurus. And one is this handsome gentleman here, uh, John Paul. He's our AAA car doctor. Um, and then we also have Robert Sinclair. So on that Northeast, um, that YouTube page, there is an entire playlist of all electric vehicles, uh, webinars and interviews and one-on-ones with automakers that they've done. Um, if you'd like to spend some time looking at that, you're more than welcome. Um, so with, uh, with John Paul here, he has been at AAA for 35 years um, and he's our car doctor. So he began his career as an automotive technician. And to this day, <clears throat> he maintains his master certification. Um, he is president of the New England Motor Press Association, and he's a member of the Society of Automotive Engineers. He is chairman of several vocational school automotive advisory boards. He's an advisor to the AAA National Automotive Engineering Board. And any questions I have regarding vehicles, I go to John Paul. Um, if you have any questions that I can't answer, I would, what I would ask is that I would say email them to me, um, and this is what I did with the other organization, email them to me, I will email them to John so he's not getting 85 emails, um, and then I will be able to respond with all of the emails that, um, or all of what he has uh, responded to your questions. And. Um, John is actually, he, he also did all of our test drives for the publication. Um, so he's evaluated more than a thousand new cars in his career. And he too was an early adopter of electric vehicles. So his first electric vehicle was a Renault electric leopard. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that, but that was his first EV. Um, and I believe he drives one now as well. He is, he's, um, part time, so he's semi retired, but he can't just he can't let us go that quickly. Um, but he has uh, relocated to Florida, so I believe he's uh, driving his he's tooling his little EV around down in Florida. So that is all I have. Now I can open it up to questions. Okay, um, let, let me. Uh, what's happening to my Zoom? There was one uh, very very appropriate question in the chat just now, so I'll ask it for everybody. Uh, so the AAA will help you out if you run out of gas. What do they do if you run out of charge? So this is a very good question. <laughs> I actually know the answer to this. Okay. So I, ha I had this question on the last, the last presentation as well. Um, there are some AAA clubs that have DC fast chargers equipped on their trucks. Um, and can come and deliver a charge at the roadside. We're not there yet in New Jersey, but we are trying to get there. As of right now, we will take you to the nearest charging station. Um, just like we would bring you a gallon of gas, we would take you to the nearest, we would tow you to the nearest charging station. But I actually wanna show you this because I saw it last week when I was in Colorado. Um, I just gotta find it. So this is, a, if you can see it, I'm going to hold it up. It's not really that easy, but let's see. Where's my computer? Where? Where's me? I don't see me anymore. Hold on. Okay, there I am. Okay, so this is one of the, the fast chargers. Um, this is, I believe, either AAA Oregon, Idaho, or AAA California. But as you can see back here, there is a DC fast charger on the truck. So that whole truck, well, usually would be a battery truck is actually um, a charging truck and it will charge the um, the EV through its port right there. So again, we're trying to get there with AAA, but we're not, um, we're not there yet. 
at least in New Jersey. Thank you. I'd like to make one overall comment. And it just seems to me that an electric vehicle is inherently a much simpler machine than a gas powered car. And so ultimately, it seems to me they should be cheaper than gas cars. But of course, that's not the case now. Do you think that's where we're headed eventually? Um, I feel like with most technology, the more it gets adopted, the more ubiquitous it becomes, the more it comes down in price. So it's possible. We, again, we're years away from that. But I mean, remember, the first computers would take up a whole you know, room in your house and how many thousands and thousands of dollars were they? And now, you know, honestly, we have we have a computer in our palm of our hand. Um, but I think eventually as we get to more people adopting it, that that technology or that price may come down a little bit. Or it could be like a, a, a gas powered vehicle where the more bells and whistles, because I mean, you've got gas powered vehicles that are five digits versus, you know, six digits. and. I think there's one that's like three hundred thousand dollars. So, sure. yeah. Sky's the limit. Steve Varley. Uh, Shawnee, thank you so much for a comprehensive and, and very balanced presentation. Quick question: uh, A little over a year ago, we replaced a fourteen-year-old car, and and we looked very intensively at EVs. Uh, we decided against them in the end, and uh, one of the reasons uh, was the fact that we tend to keep cars for so long. And our concern about uh, how long battery packs would last, we saw estimates of eight to 10 years. And we do understand that replacing a battery pack can be prohibitively expensive. Any, any thoughts on that? Personally, I don't. I mean, that's a question I would definitely would ask. And I, I have to look and I have to reference the notes that John Paul gave me from the last presentation, because I think somebody brought that up as well. Um, I can certainly send Art and Paul. Um, I'm actually going to copy all of the questions out of the chat and ask John Paul to touch on them. And then I'll email them to them and have them spread it out to the whole group. But I definitely will. I, I want to say that I do have an answer for that question. I just don't have it off the top of my head. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ron Weinger. Uh, hi. Uh, I almost missed this presentation, but I'm glad I did it. Uh, just to fill in a little bit of background, which I did into heavy research on. The global steam car company lasted until 1931. Detroit Electric lasted until 1939. I have no idea how many vehicles they sold in those periods. But the real killer of the electric cars, and I think the steam car also, was the invention of the self-starter, which took away the crank and mm -hmm. the speed play, you know, and a 45-minute startup of the steam engine. So uh, that, that was pretty much doomed at the time. The other factor was in 1914, a Detroit Electric was $2,650, $2, which is the equivalent today of around sixty dollars to $70,000. And nobody had 10-year leasing, you know, 10-year financing or leasing available. So you had to be pretty rich to buy a Detroit Electric, you know, to buy an electric car when they were in their heyday which also led to their demise because sixty to $70,000, you could have bought a Duesenberg. Uh, now, the, my question is, of course, is uh, Easter weekend, that Saturday, I was in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. And uh, you being an East Coast person, you must have some familiarity with Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. None at all? No. Okay, well, the main thing about Bay Ridge, Brooklyn is there are a lot of apartment houses and no parking for them except on the street. And I can't see driving, you know, driving through there on Saturday. And that was the first time I've driven through there since the, uh, oh, 1970, when I went to school. But driving through there, you know, that Saturday, I'm thinking, first thing is, there is no way people in that area are going to buy an electric car, because there's no way they are going to charge it. So... I am glad you brought that up because I did, I had a quick minute while you were sharing that information to pull up my questions from the last presentation. Um, and somebody did ask, are there plans for curbside charging for people who live in apartments or other urban residential situations? And John said, yes. Um, actually, I think the person that asked that question is on the call today. Um, 
but anyway, the answer was yes. Companies like Spark Charge will um, will do curbside recharging. Um, some apartment buildings are also um, factoring in um, EVs and and building these apartment buildings with with EV chargers um, as part of the amenities, part of the property. Um, and then there's also legislation in many states to allow less steps and less red tape to put charging stations in condos and apartments. So um, if you can be recharged at your curb, like curbside, um, you know, then maybe people will adopt it more. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's all gonna, it's all very new still. Let's put it that way. It's all still very, very new technology. Uh, yeah, I think you should also drive through Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. A lot of the apartment houses in there go back to the 1920s and 1930s. And well, no yeah. way anything is going to be retrofitted to anything. Okay. To any kind of cost. Okay. So Joel, Joel said his daughter lives in Queens and her parking lot has chargers for EVs as well. So that'd be interesting. Now I want to go to Bay Ridge, Brooklyn and, 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 and see, and see what it's all and see what it's like. Look at you. Tourism. You're selling tourism. Ken Lindhorst. Ken, oh, I have to send you an unmute request. There you go. There we go. Is it working now? Yes. yes. My question has to do with the safety of charging particularly um bolt chevy bolts were not supposed to be charged in the garage are more than 90 percent because of the fire hazard i i don't know about the other ones but what, what is the criteria if there are any with respect to installing in a garage a, a charger uh, and what safety precautions have to be met is there any state laws or regulatory um, um, requirements with regard to charging inside of a garage i will look that up and i will put that into the doc document that i send out post i'll look and see if there's any laws at least in new jersey on the books um as far as that is concerned um i know there is a lot of concern and i didn't touch on it at all there is a lot of concern about ev batteries um and fires although the incidences them are very low there's still obviously a lot of technology i went to the auto show the new york international auto show and i went to the um world traffic safety symposium that was the day before and they actually had a firefighter come talk about um ev battery fires and uh and there's there's a lot of concern with those just because they can last for so long and they do have the potential to reignite days and hours and days later um but i'm sure they're as as the technology evolves they're going to um, definitely take these into consideration um when when we're talking about uh like what you said, Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, or areas where there's a lot of people and it's densely populated. Um, and and uh, and I hope that answers your question, but I will put that in the, if you do me a favor, if anybody has a question that I've said I will um, address later, can you just put it in the chat anyway? Cause I'm gonna cut and paste everything out of the chat and then um, and then send it to my, my car guru um, and, and get back to you. So before the presentation, is over um i will i will do that um there was a question i just saw so yes evs do make a noise um they have to um there it's usually a, a low hum or something just to let you just to let people know that there is an ev um so i answered that one um there was movement to have artificial yes there is artificial noise how is an EV heat and cool the interior? So I have that question. I will share with you um, somewhere else. And yeah, so I'm gonna, um, so when we're like right before we end, I'll just cut and paste the whole chat. Okay, okay so Shona, let me add a question either to, to answer now or later, but uh, it's a high level question. So how do EVs fit into the overall conversation about global warming 
you know, I mean, certainly it, it, they, they address air pollution because they're not putting out fumes, but the right. energy still has to come from somewhere. And so somebody's probably burning something so that I can charge my car. Well, there's a lot of people that will also talk about the mining of these lithium ion batteries. Yeah. Um, but Mitch, are you on? Is it Mitch Erickson that's on here? Yeah, he's a chemist. So he okay, knows, okay, he yeah, he, this stuff. he was on the one I did in, in March. Um, and he had um, he had referenced solid state batteries um, that are are I believe he said cheaper, more rugged, maybe safer. I'm not sure um, if he's still on. Does he want to touch on that? Mitch, are you still there? It's it's yeah. it's coming. It's a research thing. The Chinese are leading the charge on that, and uh, our own Nolan Ash, who's not here today. Uh, is invested heavily in it. It's, it's supposed to be the new big best, new best thing. The whole area of batteries is evolving rapidly. The technology, uh, they're even talking about swapping out battery modules. So if you, if you have 100 little cells and you drive 10% of those cells, you stop at a, a swap station and it just ch swaps out those 10% of those cells. That's, it's out there, but you know, not, not coming soon to you. Um, so, but the, yeah, the answer is, is uh, it's all evolving and there are a lot of other battery options. Uh, we've all carried lead acid for decades in our cars. Um, but the reason that we don't use lead acid is because it's heavy and lithium is way up there in the northwest corner of the periodic table and it's light and that's why we use it. Um, I might also ma uh, just give you guys all a, a thought experiment. Suppose that the battery vehicles had actually uh, been been in our lives for all of our lives. And somebody came along and said, you know, I think I should start selling in internal combustion engine cars. And I want everybody to drive around with 20 gallons of gasoline right under their butt. And, you know, nobody nobody would buy that. I mean, so, so there's safety issues galore. And I, I've talked too long. Go ahead. Okay, no, so, I love that. Thank you so much for jumping in. There's always somebody smarter than me in the room. So, <laughs> well, look, it's 11:33, so I, I have to ask Shani if you can stick around for a few more minutes. We still have a couple of hands raised. I so certainly okay. can. Okay, so John Tomaszewski. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hi. Quick, quick question. Um, do the public places charge for uh, uh, charging? Like if you pull up to him, is there a charge? Yes, and it, it varies. It varies by charging station. It varies by company. But yes, there is usually a charge associated with um, charging at a public. At a public. And do you charge. know? Do you know about what the amounts would be? Yeah. Um, I don't. Um, let me see. Hold on. That was also a question that was asked before. So let me see if that was answered i don't think it was the question the question that was answered in that presentation was actually what is the weight for a charge um but i mean i can ask i i, I really honestly don't know the answer to that question as far as what is the what what, what is the average because i guess i i mean it, it would depend i guess on a lot of things prices are different for everything based on where you are you know um joel said that if you're in westfield there's no fee to charge thank, thank I, you i make the observation that you know i drive around i see one or two charging stations in the parking lot of a king supermarket or actually in the summit parking lot. these are convenience things obviously if very many people started using them they wouldn't be of much use because you'd never find one free so this is the complimentary th service, I think, from those places. Mm -hmm. At any rate, uh, Ivan Jacobs. Uh, first, let me say that I'm a proud uh, Tesla Model S owner. And I'm always asked the question, how much has my electrical bills increased? And I haven't noticed any increase at all from before the Tesla to after that, because it charges you know, from 4 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock in the morning when the rates are low. And so I'm very pleased with that. And it's a very convenient way of, uh, of uh, charging my Teslas. I'm very pleased in that respect. And I have not noticed any increase in electrical costs. They might have had, they might be, but I haven't noticed any. That's good to know. Thank you. 
welcome and i think i got i think i got everything i'm just gonna do the chat one more time um i think rich yeager is the last one to ask a question so i'm gonna go cut and paste this and there was a question in there actually i could i think i can answer um whoops i think there's one more now that i just cut and pasted oh no um what was it somebody asked um does triple a have an idea or position regarding how new jersey should collect highway taxes so um there are thoughts to instead of the gas tax which obviously um currently is a way of funding um there's a uh, talk of a um vehicle miles traveled so basically for electric vehicles that aren't paying into the transportation trust fund through that gas tax there would be a vehicle miles traveled um way of <clears throat> having people pay into the system. But again, that's still years away. So Shawnee, I, I, I think that probably a, a very large fraction of us are members of AAA. We love that, thank you. You know, we, you and I were talking earlier. I mean, that's the best towing insurance in, deal in town, so why not be a member? And, um, and I am sure that AAA has a lot of services that I don't know about, so I'm you know, underutilizing my membership and it, it, you know, it's too bad we didn't have time to talk to you about other benefits that we should that we should know about. So may, maybe we'll have to have you back some other day. But thank you. Th th this was this was a very important topic for us all. I think we learned a great deal. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Okay. So thank you very much, gentlemen and ladies. I think I did see a couple ladies on here. But thank you very much. Yeah. I think with that, we, unless somebody has one final question to ask. This is good. Okay. So, um, Art, we hand the mic back to you. Very good. Well, thank you, Shani. That was a terrific presentation. You're very welcome. And uh, I want to know, want you to know that Old Guard has two ways of thanking its speakers. First, the certificate, which you see <coughs> will be sent to you shortly. It's a certificate of appreciation. And you will know on that uh, certificate is a drawing of an orchid going back to the days when Summit was actually, actually a major producer and distributor of orchids in the country and even in the world for certain types. Uh, and it, it's, I'm sorry to say, if we were in person, you would actually get a, a real orchid instead of just a picture of one. <laughs> you learn something new every day. I did not know that. Uh, and the second way we thank people uh, is we unmute and we applaud. Thank you very much. Welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. I was glad I'm able to glad I'm able to give you the the presentation. Great job, Sean. Okay, to uh, to Art and to Shawnee, thank you so much. And to uh, Shawnee, uh, we are we are absolutely honored that uh, despite uh, your time zone hopping and uh, the judging you'll be doing this afternoon, that you have made time to be with us. Thank you uh, so much.